This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. For him, in the course of life and death from Sun to Dombey, and for nearly twenty years had been the sole representative of the firm. Of those years he had been married ten, married, as some said, to a lady with no heart to give him, whose happiness was in the past, and who was content to bind her broken spirit to the dutiful and meek endurance of the present. Such idle talk was little likely to reach the ears of Mr. Dombey, whom it nearly concerned, and probably no one in the world would have received it with such utter incredulity as he if it had reached him. Dombey and Son had often dealt in hides, but never in hearts. They left that fancy wear to boys and girls, and boarding schools, and books. Mr. Dombey would have reasoned that a matrimonial alliance with himself must, in the nature of things, be gratifying and honourable to any woman of common sense, that the hope of giving birth to a new partner in such a house could not fail to awaken a glorious and stirring ambition in the breast of the least ambitious of her sex, that Mrs. Dombey had entered on that social contract of matrimony, almost necessarily part of a genteel and wealthy station, even without reference to the perpetuation of family firms, with her eyes fully open to these advantages, that Mrs. Dombey had had daily practical knowledge of his position in society, that Mrs. Dombey had always sat at the head of his table and done the honours of his house in a remarkably ladylike and becoming manner, that Mrs. Dombey must have been happy, that she couldn't help it, or, at all events, with one drawback. Yes, that he would have allowed, with only one, but that one certainly involving much. They had been married ten years, and until this present day on which Mr. Dombey sat jingling and jingling his heavy gold watch chain in the great armchair by the side of the bed, had had no issue. To speak of, none worth mentioning. There had been a girl some six years before, and the child who had stolen into the chamber unobserved was now crouching timidly in a corner whence she could see her mother's face. But what was a girl to Dombey and son? In the capital of the house's name and dignity, such a child was merely a piece of base coin that couldn't be invested. A bad boy. Nothing more. Mr. Dombey's cup of satisfaction was so full at this moment, however, that he felt he could afford a drop or two of its contents even to sprinkle on the dust in the bypath of his little daughter. So he said, Florence, you may go and look at your pretty brother, if you like, I dare say. Don't touch him. The child glanced keenly at the blue coat and stiff white cravat, which, with a pair of creaking boots and a very loud ticking watch, embodied her idea of a father. But her eyes returned to her mother's face immediately, and she neither moved nor answered. Next moment the lady had opened her eyes and seen the child, and the child had run towards her, and standing on tiptoe, the better to hide her face in her embrace, had clung about her with a desperate affection, very much at variance with her years. "'Oh, Lord, bless me,' said Mr. Dombey, rising testily. "'A very ill-advised and feverish proceeding this, I am sure. I had better ask Dr. Peps if he'll have the goodness to step upstairs again, perhaps. I'll go down.' I'll go down. I needn't beg you, he added, pausing for a moment at the settee before the fire, to take particular care of this young gentleman, Mrs. Blockett, sir, suggested the nurse, a simpering piece of faded gentility, who did not presume to state her name as a fact, but merely offered it as a mild suggestion. Of this young gentleman, Mrs. Blockett. No, sir, indeed. I remember when Miss Florence was born. Aye, 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 said Mr. Dombey, bending over the basket bedstead and slightly bending his brows at the same time. Miss Florence was all very well, but this is another matter. This young gentleman has to accomplish a destiny. A destiny, little fellow. As he thus apostrophized the infant, he raised one of his hands to his lips and kissed it. 
then, seeming to fear that the action involved some compromise of his dignity, went, awkwardly enough, away. Dr. Parker Peps, one of the court physicians,